Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters. So, uh, apologize firstly for coming late. Uh, my topic is the intelligence of our Prophet. So I'll try to uh, speak about that. Uh, someone so unintelligent, it's difficult to speak about, so intelligent. Traditionally, our scholars have defined that there are five things that we believe about prophets that are very essential. Just like Allah SWT in Islam has certain uh, minimum attributes that we believe about Him, that He is one, He is all powerful, He is all knowing. Uh, and knowing these attributes helps us know, know Allah SWT. There's also five qualities that we must believe in about messengers and prophets. And this is basic knowledge, but inshallah I'm going to talk about one of those qualities, which is their intelligence, which in Arabic is referred to as Fatanat. Uh, those five qualities are, one of them is truthfulness. All prophets were very truthful, Siddur. and They never ever lied, uh, always spoke truthfully, very trustworthy. Uh, the next one was trustworthiness. Um, all the prophets were Amin. In fact, as we know, our Prophet Islam, his nickname before he became a prophet was Al Amin. Uh, this, um, they, they all had actually all of them. Nuh alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam. You could trust anything. You could trust your house, your woman, your wealth, your cars, anything with these people. If they existed today. They were the most trustworthy people. In fact, our Prophet Islam himself, like in Mecca, uh, people used to leave their money with him. They belonging with him. They always trusted him. Even the money that they used to reward his assassins, they left it with him. That's how much they trusted him. Uh, prophets always communicated Allah's revelation, what we call tabliq. That whatever came to them, they uh, they conveyed it. They did not withhold anything. And they were like pure messengers. That whatever they received, they they transmitted. And they did a very good job of this. They were always busying themselves in inviting people to Allah's religion and to believe in Allah and the hero of them. We call this tabneer. Uh, uh, each of these topics can be spoken about for a while. I'm just mentioning them. I'll speak about the last one, which is intelligence and fatana. The fourth quality is the prophets were infallible. Isma, the ummahasul. Prophets did not commit any sins. This is the beautiful thing about Islam. We, because our uh, tradition says, also logic says that Allah is going to appoint role models for people to follow. They should be perfect role models. So people can imitate them. If someone is flawed and it's very well known, it's hard to imitate them. So prophets are all sinless in Islam. Again, this is something that we talk about because unfortunately living in a Christian majority country, in the Christian traditions, they attribute many lies and false things about the prophets. Things that are being embarrassed to even mention in this lecture. Islam totally rejects it. Uh, they, those prophets never did any of those actions. Just like Isa alayhi salam, he never asked anyone to worship him. Even today, he opened the, the New Testament, he never said to worship me. Uh, yet they attributed later on to him. Same with the other prophets. These were things attributed to the known. So prophets were sinless, and our prophet never ever committed a sin. He said, every one of you have a Satan running through your blood. He said, what about you, Ya Rasulullah? He said, I have one too, but my one has become Muslim. Uh, I mean, uh, his heart was washed when he was a kid. Even when he wanted to attend a wedding ceremony, which was pre-Islamic times, was a promiscuous, alcoholic the atmosphere, Allah SWT made him fall asleep. Didn't allow him to go there. And the fifth category is intelligence, which is the topic today. Prophets were geniuses. They were very, very intelligent people. What do we mean by this intelligence? That they spoke to people according to their level. The way they convinced people. The way they... Um, their words, like our Prophet his speech wasn't just for his immediate Sahaba. It was for people to come after him. For us today. For all of humanity. Their words were concise, full of meaning, full of wisdom. And we'll look at some examples. If I could also add... All prophets also perform miracles. 
This is an important aspect of prophethood. They perform miracles. Miracles meaning Allah Subhanahu suspended some of His laws of nature uh, to show that the one He's sending is being sent by Him. So they perform many miracles. And our Prophet's miracles number up to a thousand. Sometimes as Muslims we think the Quran is the miracle of Prophet. It is. It's the greatest miracle. It's the most living miracle. A miracle that gets younger and younger as time goes on. But there were other miracles too. And our Prophet performed many of those miracles. Uh, but intelligence, so Fatana. The Prophets and our Prophet was very, very intelligent. Despite the fact that he was brought up illiterate. Despite the fact that he'd never written a book with his right hand. Despite the fact that he did not know how to read nor write. From the beginning till the end, he was highly intelligent. In fact, some even say the reason why Allah didn't allow that to happen to him, so his mind is not polluted by the books at the time, was that so God himself could have taught him the knowledge. God himself could have taught him. And the Quran alludes to this in Surah Duha. Uh, أَلَمْ يَجِدْكَ يَتِيمًا فَآلَى وَوَجَدَكَ دَعْنًا فَهَدَى وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى Did we not find you in a poor state and we made you rich and we guided you and so on. So, our Prophet his tarbiyah, who gave him tarbiyah, his murabbi was Allah SWT himself, the Rabb al He guided him. And he was like a clean vessel. Whatever revelation came to him, drop by drop, he passed on. Um, so they had very sound judgment, words of wisdom, and a very good reasoning power. Uh, you know, we believe as Islam we look at reason and logic in moderation. It is important. The Quran asks us, do, do they not think? Don't do not reflect, do they not listen, do they not ponder? So they do not reason. So our religion is one of reason. That's why there's nothing unreasonable in Islam. It's the most simple yet most reasonable faith. Many people they say when they look at religion they say I either become an atheist or a Muslim when they're about to convert. They either end up becoming atheist or Muslim because other religions sometimes have inherent contradictions. Islam has no inherent contradiction. Everything, every belief supports one another. For example. Our belief in God and our belief in Prophets, they both support each other. The two halves of the Shahada, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, proves Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah proves Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. God's existence means there must be angels. Angels' existence means there must be hero. We could expand on this, but what I'm trying to say is that our religion is very re a reasonable religion. And reason points to it, alludes to it, and proves it. However, However, it doesn't mean uh, we become pure rationalists and try to look at our religion only through reason. There's a nice saying, because there are reasons that reason does not understand. Religion is just beyond logic and reason as well. So our Prophet Sallallahu reason was holistic. Not just, I don't just mean pure intellectual logic. He had that, he had the best of that, but he looked at people beyond them. He looked at their psychology. When he spoke to people, it's as if he grabbed their souls and spoke to them directly. Uh, his reasoning was beyond that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many attributes. One of them is that he's got the attribute of kalam, he speaks. And our Prophet wears the character of God, as we say. He said in a hadith, where the character of God. He himself wore the character of God. And just like Allah's speech, the Qur'an is so eloquent. Our Prophet in his own speech, in the Hadith, which is different to the Qur'an, it's a different style, it, it, it's also very eloquent, full of meaning. For thousands, hundreds of years till today, people from all different sciences, biology, psychology, uh, literature, poetry, historians, geologists, they've studied the Qur'an and Hadith and they've continued to be inspired by it and amazed by it. And even today, some of the most difficult problems of the world, a simple hadith sheds light to it. Bernard Shaw, a non-Muslim orientalist, he said Prophet Muhammad would solve the most difficult problems as if drinking a cup of coffee. And sometimes they say the testimony of the enemy weighs more than any other. 
And if you read with enemy Sabah, they've said a lot of great things. So he was very, very intelligent. Wahad ibn Unabi, he was a person who was very well versed in the Torah and the Gospels. He said, when compared to Prophet, the Messenger of God, all of humanity's knowledge is like a grain of sand in a vast desert. When compared to Rasulullah, all of our knowledge is a grain of sand in a vast desert. Some say that Adam salam, was taught the names of all things. Uh, the Quran says, correct? Adam salam, was taught the name Asma Kulliha, was taught the names of all things. They say our Prophet salam, when he went to Miraj, he was taught not only the names but everything in detail. He was taught everything in detail. Knowledge, he had knowledge of heaven, hell. Allah SWT taught him. The angel says, Subhanaka la ilma la ilma ma ilma. Whatever our Prophet knew was from Allah SWT. We do not attribute, like other faith traditions, divinity to our Prophet. SWT. No, not at all. Whatever he was taught, it's from Allah SWT. But he was taught everything in detail. And that's why when he spoke about something so eloquently, uh, it made so sense. For example, our Prophet says when a fly falls into your soup or food, one side of it, dip it fully in and take it out and continue eating. We, we hear this hadith, we go, oh, oh, what's this? Can't they just throw out the food? You couldn't throw out the food. For hundreds of years, people have been living in very difficult circumstances. He said when one side of the fly gets in, dip the other side in as well and take it out and continue eating. Only recently, they discovered that the fly has two wings. One of the wings has certain bacteria, and the other wing carries the antibacteria. By dipping it in, you neutralize it. You remove the harmful effects. So our Prophet could not have explained these things in detail to his Sahaba, but he spoke to them in a, in a way that they could understand. But today, till today, we're discovering there are, there's a whole, I mean, I believe there's a whole science tradition, just like there's Chinese medicine, there's a whole science tradition called Tibbet Nawumi, the medicine of the Prophet. And if Muslim scientists get into this a bit more and really study it more with today's science, I think we could discover a lot and offer a lot to the world. Even his whole promotion of science, he said, for every disease there's a cure, except for death and old age. Just that hadith encouraged so many of people from his ummah, people like Ibn Sina and all those, to go and search for these medicines. For every disease there's a medicine. He's telling it, encouraging it. So I'd just like to give a few examples of our process of intelligence. One before his prophethood, the famous one, when they're building the Kaaba. As we know, uh, the Arabs, they were very proud descendants of Ibrahim Despite they put many idols and you know, did shit, and they knew Ibrahim salam, believed in one God. But they loved the Kaaba and they wanted to protect it. So when they were rebuilding it at the time of Prophet they completed it. And when it came to putting the black stone, as the story goes, they were not sure which tribal leader should put the black stone back into the Kaaba. This was a great honor. And they got into a dispute. They were about to go to war over who should put the black stone into the Kaaba. If I give an example, who should, for example, carry the Olympic flame? Something very honorable like that. And they were about to get into a dispute. They said, look, let's just stop. Whoever next enters into the Kaaba, into the mosque, we will ask him. And they sat waiting. And when a Prophet came, they rejoiced. They said, Thank God, Al Amin has come. The trust with me. They got very happy. Because if it was anyone else, he would have said, My father should have put it. They got happy he came. And when he heard the problem, like Bernard Shaw says, fix it like a drinking cup of coffee. He said, Bring me a cup, uh, piece of cloth. Lays the cloth down, puts the black stone into it. And they said each tribal leader grabbed the end of the cloth, picked it up, so they all had the honor of carrying it. And when they did that, they said, then you should yourself, with your blessed hands, put it in the Kaaba. And he did that. Simple solution. This is just before his prophethood. He didn't engage in political things, but he was always invited sometimes to solve problems. Why was our Prophet Sassam invited to Medina? Yes, sir. Exactly. There was rivalry. Aus and Khazraj always fighting. They nearly wiped each other out. Some of them became Muslim. They said, we need a leader to you know, stop this. They invited our process. Uh, Islam's three conquests, the three holy cities of Islam and the three conquests of Islam happened without a drop of blood. 
There are people out there that is Islam spread by violence. Usually those people have not read history properly. Or they've only read Islam seen through uh, a particular person's view. But the three holiest cities in Islam, Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem, was conquered without a drop of blood. Second example, during the time of his prophethood, so I saw, you know, the way he spoke to people to invite them to believe in one God. It makes a lot of sense to us, but if you live in the Meccan society, and you're brought up seeing your parents bow down to a statue, and you yourself believe in it all the time, you'll end up doing it. Omar Adam, one day, they see him laughing, and then they see him crying, and they say, what's this, Ya Omar? He said, I remember my old days in Jahiliya. He said, I went, I went to go to a journey, so I, I didn't have a God to take with me. So I made a God out of dates, and I took it with me. And in my journey, so I could worship it. But halfway I got very hungry. So I took the God out and I ate it. He said, that's, I was crying at my silliness and I was laughing at my, you know, uh, like how silly it was and I was crying out how, because of the shit. Like that's how they were used to it. They were just brought up into it. So once one of these young, eloquent people, his name was Hussein, he came to our Prophet son and uh, he, he wanted to persuade our Prophet son to stop his mission. And the Prophet says, Ya Hussain, how many gods do you believe in? He said, eight. One in the heaven, the rest on earth. He goes, okay. When you're good, you lose your goods. Who do you pray to? He said, the one in the heaven. He said, when you get ill, severely, who do you pray to? He said, the one in the heavens. And he asked him a few questions, the one in the heavens. And he said, this is exactly what I'm saying. To just believe in the one in the heavens and follow him and forget about the rest. Hussein, he was an eloquent speaker, he came to dissuade our process of preaching. He was so impressed by this logic, he gave the shahada then and then he became Muslim. Like the way he solved small, you know, convinced people, well, it shows his intelligence. He even himself says, nas ala qadr Speak to people according to their level of understanding. You know, speak to people according to their level of understanding. Once Omar al says he went to a gathering, where Apostle was and Abu Bakr was talking, he said, I left that gathering, oh, they were crying and I was crying, but I was only crying because they were crying. I left, I have no idea what they were, I didn't understand. Like they were talking about things that he didn't, Omar Adan did not understand. Someone who 12 times or 6 times came to Apostle and insisted and revelation came confirming his opinion. Someone like him did not understand the conversation. You could imagine ordinary people. His speech was also very concise, you know, and, uh, and he himself said, all praise be to God that Allah has given me this concise speech. Uh, it was an aspect of his miraculousness. Although he wasn't taught adabiyat, we call literature, he spoke so eloquently. For example, uh, our Prophet says, the famous hadith, يُوَلُّ عَلَيْكُمْ كَمَا تَكُمْ you will be governed according to how you are. You will be governed according to how you are. And very small hadith, three words, three, four words. But in it lies great principles, great wisdom. He's saying that basically a basic principle of social administration, the way society works, is no matter what type of political system exists, to, uh, dictatorship, democracy, or monarchy, whatever, Depending on how the people are, that's how their leaders will be. You know when you have good milk, and then you have the creamy bit on top of the milk that rises if you boil it? You get good cream if the milk is good. If the milk is bad, you get bad cream. And so, if the society wants good, their leaders will be good. If the society wants bad or not good, their leaders will not be good. And this confirms one of that verse of the Quran that Allah says, Allah does not change the condition of a people, until they change what is in their own selves. And if you look at this from a psychological perspective, look how empowering this is. Let's say you're in a society where there's a tyrant. And if you haven't traveled to the Muslim world, like I've always been ignorantly brought up most of my life in Australia, in here you can say anything. You can swear at Julia Giver. Nothing happens to you. You go to the Muslim world, and I was shocked when I went to Jordan. You say a few things, you're worried there are spies around you. You can't say much. You know, you have to be quiet. Uh, but imagine if you're brought up in a society that's oppressed. You can't say anything. You can't do anything. The person on the top of you is a tyrant. What you can do, you feel, uh, you feel uh, no power. 
But when you think about it, if we change ourselves, God will change us. If we change me and my family, the people around me, our condition, this will reflect on. This will be a very, it's a very empowering way of uh, thinking. They say they came to, uh, Hajjad was a very bad ruler at the, uh, in the early times of Islam. He was very oppressive. And someone came to him and he t told him the stories of Omar Adam, how just he was, how fair he was. And Hajjad said, if you were like the people of Omar, I would be like Omar. But once they came to Ali bin Abi Talib and they said, how come in your Khilafah there's wars, there's, there's even now two Khilafah, there's disunity. At the time of Omar Adam, when there was such great justice, people came to Ali and trying to accuse him. He said, at the time of Omar Adam, I was his chief of justice. I was underneath him. He had people like me, I had people like you. That's why he's got, uh, we've got problems. So the, the society affects the people. If you have a government where everyone in it is very righteous, this naturally will affect them. But Apostle says simply, you will not can come out of you. You'll be ruled over the way you are. Another hadith Apostle says, I'm just going to give a few examples. If you have any good example of Apostle that you'd like to share with everyone else, I think it would be a good opportunity to have a discussion, so it's not a one-way uh, speech. Our Prophet says, Al-mar'u ma'a man ahab. A man is with him whom he loves. Once he came as the is crying. And look at this from looking from an emotional side, how he affected you. He said, why are you crying? He said, Ya Rasulullah, even if I make it to Jannah, you are a prophet of God. You be at the highest of levels, I might just scrape it in, you know, I might not be with you. He was crying that he won't be able to be with our Prophet in general. And our Prophet says something very simple. Al Maru Ma'aman A man is with him who is a man is with the person whom he loves. I mean if you love me, you'll be with me. Simple words, but he solved his emotional problem at the time. But it also teaches us many things. Who are the people that we love? If you want to be with the prophets and the awliya and the saints and the scholars in Jannah, you should love them. If you love the people that are, who knows, going to heaven or hell, but if they end up going to hell, you'll be with them as well. So be careful who you love too much. This is an advice for us. Once our Prophet son, uh, there was a companion called Nuaiman. And this companion, Radhanu, had a problem with drinking. He couldn't give it up. So when he, uh, one of the other companions reproached him, said some bad things about him, our Prophet in intervened, stopped him. He said, do not help shaitan against your brother. He said, wallahi, he loves Allah and his messenger. Look at the psychology. He's, he's the head of state. Alcohol is prohibited. Someone is doing it. Another companion reproaches him. He stops him. Look at the psychological movement. He said, don't help shaitan against your brother. He's saying, I swear that he loves Allah and his messenger. What this shows us is that if you see someone doing something bad, yet they have their Muslim or they do have good aspects, you focus on the good aspects. You don't ignore it, you try to help him. But if you keep encouraging him, he will get better. There's a saying, if you tell someone you're good, you're good, you're good, even if he's a bad person, he'll become good. And if someone is good and then everyone thinks they're bad, 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 they get told you're bad, you're bad, they'll become bad. So we should encourage that you see a sister going to Salah praying, Sister Marshall, you're a great you're a great ambassador for this religion. You can do so much. So many of the young girls can look up to you. <coughs> Please keep it up, mate. make dua. I look up to you. You know, don't praise someone's ego too much, but say these encouraging words. So once after a while they hear that oh people are looking up to me, I better fix myself up. Same with brothers. Instead of saying, Sister, I saw you praying, there were two mistakes. I want to highlight these two mistakes. Not like this, just encourage it. We can give many uh, hadith, but I would like to just maybe, uh, I want to leave Brother Adam 15 minutes for question and answers, or just discussion. Uh, but I would just like to leave one about our Prophet's speech to the Ansar. This is a very famous speech, uh, but it's, it really, in my opinion, sums up his intelligence, how on the spot he solves the most difficult problems. A lot of his intelligence also shows, for example, the things he says about the future, how he predicts it. This is the wahi that he received. But when they had conquered Mecca, our Prophet, after the Battle of Hunayn, 
was a very difficult battle. A lot of spoils of war uh, came their way. Uh, for example, there was 24,000 camels, 40,000 sheep, 10,000 pounds of gold and silver. Now, they had come back to Mecca and, and participate in this battle. The initial helpers, the Ansar, uh, what happened Apostle, after this battle of Hanayn, he gave a lot of the Ghanima, the spoils of war, to the leaders of Mecca, like Abu Sufyan. To Abu Sufyan, he gave himself uh, how much? Uh, 300 camels, 250 pounds of gold, and so on. That's a lot. Imagine if you give someone uh, 200 uh, Ferraris, for example. It's a lot of wealth. And the Ansar saw this. It's not they got jealous because of the worldly reasons. He thought, why are these people who are the enemies of Islam, who have just converted, why is the Prophet treating him so much like this? And plus they're thinking, maybe at the back of their mind, is it because he himself is from Mecca? He's treating his Meccan like that? And a few people started saying this and the word got around. One of the Sahaba Sa'ad ibn Ubada, who's one of the Ansar, the leading Ansar, he came and he told us to Rasulullah He said, gather all the Ansar, immediately. He gathered and he spoke to them, just the Ansar. And this is what he said. O oh, community of the helpers, Ya Ansar, I hear that you are displeased with me. He said, he asks them, Were you not in misguidance when I came to you? Weren't you guys in misguidance that I came to you? And has not God guided you through the truth through me? Were you not in poverty when I came to you? And has God not enriched you through me? Were you not in internal conflicts, like we said, the Aus al Khazar, in war, when I came to you? And has God not reconciled you through me? And they all agreed, saying, Ya Rasulullah, Sadaqta Ya Rasulullah, you're true, you're, you're right. Uh, we are indebted to Allah and His Messenger. He reminds them of this. Then he continues. He doesn't just say, Oh, look, I did, did this did for you. Be quiet. He continues. He says, Oh, Ansar, if you had desired, you could have answered me differently. You could have said, Your people denied you. But we believed in you. you. You came to us with no one to defend you, but we admitted and protected you. You could have said this. Your people exiled you, but we embraced you. You came to us with nothing to subsist on, and we met all your needs. He's reminding you, you could have said this, because the Ansar did that. They hosted not only the Prophet, all the Muhajirs. They came with nothing. They gave everything, they had half of it. They're willing to give all of it. He's saying, he's reminding them of their favors. And he said, if you had responded like this to me, you would have told the truth and no one would have stood up to contradict you. And then he continues, he says, Oh Ansar, even if you're upset with my actions, wouldn't you rather return home with God's messenger while they return home with sheep and, and camels? He said, at the end of the day, wouldn't you want the Rasulullah to go with you to Medina and give the sheep and camels to them? Because he owed so much to the Ansar, Apostle chose to live in Medina and stay in Medina. And that's why Yathrib became Medina to Manawara, the Medina of the Prophet. Uh, he said, I will go back to you. He said, I swear by God, in whose hand of power is my soul, that if all other people took a different direction than that of the Ansar, I would not hesitate to go with the Ansar. If all of the people went this way, and the Ansar went this way, I will go with the Ansar. Had it not been for the immigration, I would have wished with all my heart to be one of the Ansar. Oh Allah, protect the Ansar and their descendants. He says, I would have myself wanted to be one of the Ansar. And when he's saying these words, words the whole Ansar break into tears. They said the beads were <coughs> sobbing wet. And he said, uh, we are content with Allah and His Messenger. Uh, we don't want anything else. And this is a famous speech, I'm sure you've heard of it before, very emotional. But what's interesting is, look at this situation happening. He's giving spoils of war, Ansar, this bad card is growing. If, it, if this had grown bigger, this could have caused internal war. It could have caused uh, so many mistakes. But our Prophet firstly, pulled the Ansar aside. So by them talking to him just specially, he's honoring them. So they feel special. He's, he's also not speaking about this in front of the other uh, Mecca chief saying they can go with the sheep and camels. He's speaking to people according to them. He is also 
uh, in its Arabic, this, uh, this speech is beautiful, in its original Arabic. And, uh, you know, the way he op dramatically opens. You know, I mean, just like we study in English, uh, Shakespeare, all that language. Look, we should get our, our students, our brothers to study this speech. It's amazing, literary piece. The opening, dramatic opening. Oh, I'm sorry, I hear you're displeased with me. Immediately grabs their attention and continues going at this rate. Um, so this was a, an example of our person that I, personally, one of my favorite ones that I wanted to share. So our person, the way he spoke, the way he acted, always was full of intelligence. He broke them, like Bernard Shaw says, I've said it three times now, he solved the most difficult problems, like the drinking of coffee. Okay, that's what I wanted to uh, mention. There are more hadith that we can go through, but do we have any, any comments we want to make, any questions?